is that we'll be giving uh, the next few classes on introducing the safety part of course for this course. Uh, Tom taught uh, OM4 for a number of years prior to this, uh, but I guess he's retired, so many of you have never met, met Tom. So uh, he used to be a part here in the energy department, works in the process control area in the MSPC. Uh, and still teaches part of this course to, well, all of this course to uh, the students in California at USC. So really happy to have Tom here. Uh, he wrote the safety chapter that's in your notes and just the author of also some of the other parts of the notes. So thank you very much for your So, hi. So, who's taking process control? Oh, thank you for buying the book. I just got an email from somebody in South Africa who's using the book in their course. I never get any residuals from South Africa. I don't know what's going on. So how's four and four going? Pretty well? Of course? Yeah. Professor Dunn here pretty good. He's uh, taking over and done a better job than I could ever. So safety. It's it's a it's a topic that almost needs no motivation. You know, we want to be safe. We want to be safe for ourselves, and we want to make sure that we engineer safely for other people. You've had safety from high school, right? When you go into the laboratory, the chemistry teacher said, "Do not take a pipette and stick it in your ear." Right? Say, so "Don't do that. Don't run with a glass full of a beaker full of acid." Most of the safety you've had up to now is about not hurting yourself in the laboratory procedures. What we're going to talk about now primarily is engineering safety. When you design and you operate big equipment and plants and manufacturing facilities, how do we do that so that we don't endanger ourselves and more importantly all the other people who are out there operating the plants? So we're taking it up enough. And, and you're going to need all of your engineering skills, heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and process control, and all that stuff. We have to add some, some new material. That's what we're going to be doing in the next couple of lectures. So, first I'm going to give you a summary. One little slide says what, what is in this safety topic. Uh, then we're going to take a quick look at how safe or unsafe is the chemical industry. Because I'm going to show you some disasters. I don't want you to think that disasters are normal. Disasters are normal, but we still have to learn from these disasters. We have to see what kind of mistakes have people made so that we don't uh, continue and, and do those again. Okay. So, the next, uh, the, the, the safety part of the course, and of course, after this, in each of your projects, there's going to be a safety section. You're going to have to write uh, an analysis, a safety analysis of the process that your group is doing. So the introduction. What's our safety record and what are some common uh, industrial well-known accidents that have occurred? So from the industrial accidents, we'll see that if we don't do the engineering properly, the consequences can be dramatic and catastrophic. So that's, a, that's a good motivation. And we'll also look at what kind of mistakes are made. And people repeat these mistakes over and over again. We don't want that to happen. Oh, by the way, so the class notes, everybody has the class notes. This is not in the class notes. So we can post this uh, after class. Now, then after we are really motivated and we're, we kind of understand what, what can go wrong, we're going to look at some solutions. So how do we, what do we add to a design to contribute to its safety? And that's these next two points, the safety hierarchy and pressure relief and subsequent processing. So that's part of the safety hierarchy. So we're going to have two lessons on the solutions. Then we've got a whole toolkit of solutions. Where do we put the solutions? Why do we apply an alarm here and a shutdown system there? Well, that's going to be in the hazards and operability system. So this is a systematic way to look at your process, go point to point to point, and say, 
There's really no safety problem here. I'm going to move over. Uh oh, there's a safety problem here. It has to do with pressure. Then over here. Oh, there's a safety problem here, and it has to do with a hazardous material. And to look through the entire process, and then when you find a safety problem, you'll come back up to the safety hierarchy and say, how can I make sure that that problem, that potential problem, that potential hazard doesn't cause <coughs> So solutions, and then how do we apply the solutions is the head on. And then we'll conclude with a workshop on uh, a, a particular uh, uh, accident that beat in Texas City. Uh, it's very well documented. There's a nice video of animation showing the fluids going through the pipes and people walking around. So you get a real good understanding of what happened. So we'll, we'll talk about that and go through the video, and then there'll be a workshop afterwards for you to analyze the problem and suggest improvements that could have been made to prevent that accident. Okay, so motivation, solutions, problems, or identify where the problems might be, and then a workshop. Any questions on that? Is that what you want to learn about safety? Is there anything else? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, a quick look at how safe are we. Some terms that, that, that you could need to use. The FAR is the fatal accident rate. This is mostly used in the United Kingdom. This is the number of fatalities occurring for 1,000 working lifetimes. Okay, so we have 1,000 people. And they all work for their entire careers. How many of them are going to get killed in, at work? That's an important number to know. So it's not zero, but we don't want it to be a big number. Sometimes this is uh, transferred into a fatality rate of fatalities per year. So you take the FAR, multiply how many hours you worked in a year, and divide by 10 to the 8. Okay, but those two are the same. Then in the States, they use the OSHA incident rate. This is the number of illnesses and injuries for one, about 100 work years. Now, what's the major difference between the uh, FAR and the OSHA incidence rate? Yes? The severity of whatever happened, I guess. Yeah, okay. So, one of the accidents we're going to look at, 15 people died. 15 people died in that accident. And in that year, the safety manager of the plant received a bonus because the OSHA incidence rate was very low. Very few people were injured, but 15 people were killed. That doesn't make any sense, does it? The guy took the money, but then the newspapers found out about it and shamed him into giving it back. So, any one of these metrics on its own can be can be twisted around a bit, right? So you want to know how many people are injured and how many people are killed and all kinds of other things. What's an accident? Normally an accident is what's called a lost time injury. If you can come back to work every day, it's not an accident. So one of the places I worked in industry, we had a fellow who broke his arm. So what did they do? They brought him back in. He was an operator, so he was doing physical things. He couldn't do that with a broken arm. And they had him sit in a chair every day until his arm got better. Then what happened? It doesn't show up as an accident. He didn't have an accident. So you have to be careful. These numbers are, are, are important, but the minute we have little metrics and numbers and we quantify things, people start to cheat. Okay, so you have to have a number of these and see how they're actually calculated to know whether you're getting the truth about the situation. Another one. Did you have anybody killed in your company? No. Nope. What about that contractor who came in and was doing some piping and got killed? Well, that doesn't count. He's not our employee. So people move the numbers around, right? They try and get, try and not count all of these things. So you have to be very careful about this. Oh, these are the kinds of numbers you're going to see. So they're important. The warning is make sure you see a bunch of them and you look behind the details. 
So how, how good or how bad are we in the chemical industry? This is the FAR. How many people get killed in a thousand lifetimes of work? Staying at home is three. Now these numbers change. Every time you look at a different set of data, it's obviously a different sample. And we know from statistics that things change a little bit. So there should be confidence in this obvious. But in this group, it's a three. The chemical industry is four. Steel industry is eight. Mining is 40. Working in asbest work with asbestos, 620. <coughs> so we know that, that Quebec was exporting asbestos around the world for a long period of time, saying, oh, it's not dangerous. You don't really have to worry about that. 620 compared to three. 200 times. All right, so, so we're not doing too bad. We're almost. A, a typical approach for safety is you should be as safe at work as you are at home. That's kind of reasonable. And you should be safer at work than you are driving to work. Sure. So, so the number is kind of, sometimes this is a little bit below this, depending on the sample and reference. <coughs> but so the chemical industry has a pretty good record. We get a lot of bad press because when we make a mistake, it's a big one. It's a big one. But generally speaking, we're pretty good. So what's the fatality rate for the chemical industry? How would you calculate the fatality rate for the chemical industry? Fatality rate is the FAR times the number of hours worked in a year. That's not all the hours in a year because you're not at work the whole time, right? You're studying for and for 24 hours a day. But when you graduate, you only have to work eight hours a day. Okay, so we would take the number of hours worked and divide by 10 to the 8, and we would get the fatality rate. What do you suppose the fire is for cigarette smoking? I know nobody here smokes cigarettes for sure. No, isn't that high? Isn't that high? Uh, about 40. All right, so it's a factor. So this is a, the fatality uh, rate for the chemical industry. And so times 10 if you smoke. So don't smoke. That's our first safety rule. OK, so what's our basis now? We, how did we get to this basis? Um, we have to maintain the risk for involuntary activities. And work, if we consider it involuntary activity, uh, than typical for things like staying at home. So staying at home, now some of you might enjoy rock climbing, right? Up the face of a rock a cliff with no ropes or anything, you might enjoy that. That's not called staying at home. You know, we want to be safer than that. That may be your voluntary activity, but it's not mine. Right, so so we, want to, we want to also remember that this risk is all the risk. We can't look at the, well, the, the, the this little chemical reactor over here, the, the risk of that killing you is about the same as staying at home. But we have a thousand other things going on in the plant. So we have to add up all of those risks, those thousands of things, the pipe breaking, all kinds of things going on. And that has to be less than staying at home. Okay, we have to remember we don't want to hurt anybody outside the site. So we can't we can't say well we're safe in here but you know Kathy Hamilton just got killed because we released some toxic material. Um, the other thing is is the fatalities is the frequency times the fatality per accident. So the total fatalities is the frequency of this occurring times the fatalities per accident. 
most accidents are going to be small down here. Some of them could be large, not 100,000. But if you're, if you're working in the nuclear industry, and some of you may, that 100,000 is not an unreasonable number if you have a big accident, if you had a big release. So we've got to make sure that we keep the, the likelihood very, very small when we're dealing with very, very toxic materials. Okay, so that's, so the message is that in general, the industry is doing very well. But it's doing very well because engineers know about safety and we, we spend a lot of time in safety reviews. And we apply all of our engineering skills to make our plans. They're not inherently safe. We operate very high pressures, very high temperatures, very dangerous materials. So it's only because we've studied safety that get a record that's as good as, yeah. So, have any questions on that or comments? <clears throat> if, if you don't ask a question, then Professor Dunn has to ask a question. <laughs> no? I can't pull rank, I don't have any rank. Okay, so, let's look at some bad examples. Motivation, but also to see what kinds of things go wrong. So this is a famous statement: "Those who did not learn from history are doomed to repeat it." Normally, that's quoted about war, and recessions, and depressions, and things like that. But it also has to do with good and bad engineering. Uh, often, when there's a really bad thing that happens, then legislation and, and new engineering practices are generated because of it. Uh, so it's good to study some of these really bad ones. So the, uh, in, in the Gulf Coast, the uh, uh, deep water horizon that exploded and, and the disaster a couple years ago, there's new legislation because of that. The Fukushima nuclear plant in uh, Japan, that's generating studies now which will ultimately come in new, new legislation and new design practices. So it's good to know the history behind some of these rules. Sometimes we think this rule is very onerous. Oh, I've got to do all this work. Why, why are they making me do it? But then you find out that there was something really bad that happened and a lot of people were injured and killed. Okay, we have to remember that we're really smart. Now, Professor Dunn tells me this is a really smart class. I'm going to believe it. But we're not that much smarter than all the other people who came before us. So if they made those mistakes, it's a chance we might if we're not really well prepared. So we want to really be well prepared. So a, 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 a nice picture, a nice comparison. So we, we, we've learned, have we learned from our mistakes? There's the Hindenburg. <laughs> Does anybody know when that happened? The 1930s. I wasn't around. The 1930s. This was uh, uh, a dirigible, lighter than air, filled with hydrogen. It was the pride of Nazi Germany. They were, this was before the war. They were showing how excellent their technology was, showing it off to the world. It made its maiden flight over to New Jersey, and they think lightning struck. Surprisingly, some people survived. Now, we would never do anything like that again. And then the Challenger spacecraft, and a little O-ring. Right, so when you make a connection, the connection isn't perfect, so you put a little, a little washer thing that's kind of flexible when you make that connection, and that O-ring seals so there's no leaks. And all the engineering analysis said that O-ring is not safe. <coughs> if you keep it cold for too long a period of time, it'll become brittle, and you won't have a good seal, and you'll have a leak. Management said, we don't believe your analysis. We're going we're to take off in spite of your analysis. 
And of course, that thing will blow up in a few seconds. Everybody is dead. So, we have to pay attention to technology. Okay, one of the first of the modern big accidents that really influenced uh, the way we do engineering. And let me say, when I started engineering in the 70s, when I was in university, we never talked about safety. When I worked in the largest private corporation in what was called the free world, not the communist world, but it was a split that. We never talked about safety. We never had safety reviews. And then things like this started to happen, and all of the stuff we're talking about now moved in from kind of ad hoc to systematic. This is the Footsboro uh, uh, explosion in, in England. And um, a pipe failed. And when the pipe failed, a big uh, amount of hydrocarbon was released. And, and it, the worst thing you can have is a big amount of vapor. So if you have a puddle of liquid, it burns. If you have a huge vapor cloud, when that, ex when that ignites somewhere, there's a huge explosion because it's a lot of oxygen and you get an enormous explosion. And that's what occurred here. Now, how did this happen? There were six reactors in the plant. We needed six series reactors. Boy, this is right out of four. Six series reactors, okay. The fifth reactor started to leak. So, we, well, we can't fix it. It's just too big. These are big, by the way. These are quite, quite large. Uh, so, they decided to take the fifth reactor out of service, and they were going to run it with one, two, three, four, and six. So, they needed to connect four to six. And these are big pipes. This is a, about a 20 inch pipe. So, you know, the pipe is about that big in diameter. And these vessels are very big and they're agitated. It doesn't show here, but they're agitated. So, they're moving around. <coughs> so, these things here are bellows. They're like accordions because the, the pipes are moving a little bit and they needed to have some expansion and contraction. So, this is a very complicated mechanical system. Well, what happened was some chemist took out, uh, you know, like a piece of brown paper and said, here, here's the way to do it. Put a pipe in here. They did no analysis of things like pipe stress, what happens when this thing starts vibrating, what's the right materials, and so forth. And they built it. So, you can see the little arm here, so they put some corners in, idea, uh, without expansion. It worked for about a month or two, and then it broke open. And when it broke open, it just spewed out a whole bunch of cyclohexane, and there was an explosion. Twenty-eight workers were killed, thirty-six suffered injuries. The fire burned for several days, and after ten days, the fire still raged, and was hampering rescue. After ten days, it was still fire. So, if we think about engineering ethics, what was the big mistake here in engineering ethics? Yes? Someone's doing work, they weren't qualified to a group. Exactly. Exactly. Don't do things you don't know how to do. You can always fake it, but it's dangerous to do that. So, the person should have said, well, I think I need a pipe from here to here. But now we have to get a consultant in if we don't have a person in the company who understands the mechanical aspects of the system and can design it so it's going to be properly designed and then, of course, have it fabricated properly. So you have to be very careful. Don't do things you don't know how to do. This can have serious, serious consequences. Actually, somebody in the chemistry faculty, I was talking to him a few years ago, he started to talk about when he was on a postdoc in England, and there was this huge explosion in the city where he was. And it was this explosion. Just everything rattled in the whole city. So when this occurred, it was a wake-up call. And, and if you look through the literature, you find a lot of the 
approaches and techniques, technology, have been developed in England first because of this incident. And uh, a lot of the legislation and guidelines, and actually very good things on the internet, are available from England. So that's the Footsboro incident. Now, what about, well, we have safety systems. We're going to talk about the solutions. One of, so there's lots of solutions, right? That's it. There's a whole hierarchy of solutions. Well, if they, we have this whole hierarchy of solutions in there, the accident can't happen, or can it? So this is the Chernobyl. It was in the Soviet Union when it happened. It's now in Ukraine uh, in 1986. So this was a nuclear power plant. It was a, a, a design from a, a Russian design, which does not include a, a containment vessel. Almost all of the designs have a huge containment vessel to prevent materials that are released from the plant from influencing the environment. So, what happened here? They were successfully running the plant, they ran it for years, and as they were shutting the plant down, they were going to shut the plant down, do some maintenance, and start it back up again, and we do that periodically. Uh, one of the senior engineers decided he wanted to run an experiment he wanted to see how low he could turn the power down, turn off, turn the power off to, to some generators, how far he could take the plant down, because plants you can run from full capacity up to some lower capacity. What is that boundary that lower capacity? And that lower capacity was outside the range in which the plant should operate. So there were safety systems to prevent you from going there. If you tried to go there, the safety system would shut everything down and stop the plant safely. Well, this genius said, I want to go there, so I'm going to turn off all of the safety systems and run my experiment. That's not a good thing to do. The safety system's there for a reason. So he ran the experiment. This particular plant had an unusual feature in it, a bad feature. And when you turn the plant down, you could get a huge uh, surge in, in radiation. This one got the huge surge in radiation. It boiled all the water around the reactor very quickly. The steam pressure was so great that it blew the top off of the reactor. This is a huge, big steel vessel. It did not have that containment vessel around it, so the material blew out into the atmosphere. Oxygen then came in and ignited the carbon, so there was a carbon fire in addition to the, to the initial release, and that released more uh, material up to the environment. So, so, what about the safety systems? Well, if you turn the safety systems off, they don't go. Uh, this caused a huge issue in all of Europe because they stopped drinking milk, stopped giving children melt for many, many months for fear of uh, uh, the radiation. It gets, you know, it gets, uh, descends on the grass, the cows eat the grass, the milk gets radioactive, it's not good for your kid. Uh, 30 people were killed and uh, 28 from radiation exposure. Nobody was killed from the blast, but they had to put out the fires. And the firemen who went in there, they were very brave, uh, went in there and they were flying helicopters over this and dropping sand on and so forth to try to get the fire. A number of them were killed. Many of them, who knows, they may die early anyway because they had radiation sickness. Okay, so here's one with, that's actually a very small consequence. We don't really know. <coughs> the, the, the cancer rates for, for uh, thyroid cancer went up in Europe after this, especially for children. So this 28 is, is the immediate uh, death from this. What else has occurred, we probably will never know. Okay, uh, the next one. If you have questions, just raise your hand. Uh, this is the Bhopal, uh, India incident. This is probably, I think it's the, the worst industrial accident. 
that volcanoes blowing up or anything. But an industrial accident in the world that, that, that we know of is the Bhopalas. Thirty, at least 3,500 people were killed in this one incident. 3,500. It's a, it was a Union Carbide plant. Union Carbide no longer exists as a corporation. The president of Union Carbide became an international criminal. India wanted to extradite him. He was not extradited. The United States would not allow, allow that. What law? I don't know. There were four processes to prevent a release. So they were, as we're going to talk, after safety, we're going to talk about operability. If you have, let's say you have two parts of a plan. I got two parts of a plan here. And neither one is very reliable. They keep breaking down, and we have to fix them and start them up again. And this one breaks down. So I got two parts of the plan, and they keep breaking down. How, how could I? And I, let's say I can't improve the reliability of each piece. Is there a way I could improve the reliability of the overall system? There's one thing I could add. What would that be? This breaks down. Now, I have to shut this one. This one's not broken down, but I have to shut it down because this part stops. We go for a month. This one's broken down. Now, since they're tied together, I have to shut this one down. Is there any way I could run either one of them when the other one's broken down? What do I need? Okay, not the recycling, but you got the right idea. What's, what could go right in the middle? Yeah. The holding tank? Tank. And that's the way this plant was designed. They're making, and in the middle, the tank was methyl isocyanide. Cyanide is not a good thing. This is a very, very dangerous chemical. And they decided to build a plant with a big tank of it right in the middle. They're making pesticide at the end, but this intermediate chemical, which was highly, highly toxic, was stored. It was refrigerated. Okay, so they realized this. They're not stupid. They weren't very smart, but they weren't stupid. So they said, well, this is very dangerous. This is a bad thing, but we're going to do it because we want to make money. So they put in four different processes to prevent this, a release of this uh, methyl from the tank in the middle. Okay, so they, they built the tank for, to improve the reliability of the system. It did improve the reliability of the system, for sure. What about those four systems? All right, so what happened was there was a release. And uh, there were a community around this, a large community right around the plant. And because of the atmospheric conditions, there was sort of like uh, <clears throat> when things got released, they stayed low to the ground. They didn't disperse up into the atmosphere high. Uh, and by the next morning, 2,000 people were dead, and 300,000 were injured. Many of them were blind. I mean, there were serious injuries. Another 1,500 people died in the subsequent months. Really, nobody knows the total number of people. So 3,500 is the very lowest for one plant accident. So they had four things. Uh, First of all, they had the coolant um, in, in the tank, and that was not working properly. Then they had what they called a vent gas scrubber. So if the gas started to go out, they would have a liquid come down and absorb the methyl isocyanate. But they didn't have, they had, they had, did not have the liquid stored in the plant, so so that wasn't working. They knew that but they still operated the plant. Then, after the stuff left the scrubber, it went to a flare, and they were going to burn it. What about the flare? The flare had been dismantled for repairs. Final backup. They had water sprayed, so they're going to spray this. It would be like a scrubber, but they spray it. Wherever it dispersed, they would spray it. 
Spray should not be used because they lack sufficient pressure to reach the height of where the gas would be. Incredible. Totally irresponsible management of the plant. So you can't count on management all the time. You're going to have to have your own ethical compass. You're going to have to make some tough decisions. None of these four were working. The gas was released. The company no longer exists. It was cut up and, and after they paid the fines, they were disgraced. So it's not good business. I mean, it's, the amazing thing is that people do this, make these mistakes, and say because it's for profit. Well, it isn't for profit. It's bad business. I mean, you don't want to hurt anybody. But even if, even if you didn't care about the people, it's good business. Okay, so just another one very quickly. We have to, as engineers, we have to know where hazards can occur. We probably wouldn't think that dust is a hazard. Most of the time you say dust, it's a nuisance. I might want to have a little mask because I don't want to breathe this stuff in. But dust is very, you know, very fine material in the air and that can combust. And because it's, it's, there's such a huge surface area, you can get an explosion very easily with dust. So this is just a picture I, I picked out in the end of that a while ago. It was a pharmaceutical plant, uh, Ford then. Often people say that there are always two explosions, two dust explosions, and it's the second one that's the big one. Why is that? Why would the second one be the big one? If we had a dusty manufacturing site here, and I went like this, what would I see? I have the powder here, right? So if we, if we don't do housekeeping well, if we're not looking at safety, most of the material would have already settled. But if you get one little explosion, that rocks everything. So then all of that dust that's lying around floats up into the air, and it's the second explosion that's much bigger, because you have all of that dust that's accumulated from days and weeks of operation all blown up into the air and mixed. Then you get the second big explosion. Okay, so to me, you know, when I think dust is a nuisance, but it's not a danger. It's a danger in mines and in manufacturing. Uh, a little story. Okay, so that's so. They were making a material that was a dioxin. The intermediate was a dioxin. And they released it. They had an explosion, as you can see. Very bad situation there. And they released it to the atmosphere. They polluted some rivers and really caused a huge um, amount of trouble. But what's interesting about this particular uh, accident that has changed the laws everywhere is that nobody knew this was a dangerous plant. So when they called the fire department, the fire department came running in saying, okay, what's in here? They didn't know it was dioxin. They didn't know how to treat, they didn't know how to react to this material. There was no record anywhere. So nobody knew what to do. Once the accident had occurred, nobody could fix it. So that's why when you're out of work now, you're going to be filling out forms telling the government what is in your facility. And that's important. The fire department, the police, the hospitals, everybody has to know that. What can they, what do they anticipate? Do they have the equipment to be able to handle that kind of an accident? So everybody run in and they just stopped and said, we don't know what to do. It's too dangerous to go in. And we don't have the, the equipment. So this was in Switzerland. And that's Italy starting to walk. Okay, Three Mile Island, another nuclear plant. As a result of this, the nuclear industry died in North America. It's slightly alive, it's, it's on life support in Canada, you know, but then along came Fukushima, now it's all there. But 
it was a thriving industry until this accident. After that, in 30 years, no new plant was ordered. Okay, so what? So, so this is a nuclear plant. Uh, let's go through the scenario. There's the control room. That's the actual picture of the control room at Three Mile Island, plant number two. One of the things you you'll see is that there's a lot of stuff going out there. If you can see the picture. There's lots and lots of little things that operators have to monitor all the time. Okay, let's go through the scenario. You work for half of your shift. Things are really quiet. An alarm, alarm sounds to inform you that the main cooling pumps have shut down. So these are the pumps that pump your water around the nuclear reactor. They're important. And the control rods have been lowered to, to, re, to the reactor to reduce heating. So some graphite rods go down there. That happens automatically. While not desirable, you're not worried. This has happened many times before. And we have backup pumps. You have backup pumps. Of course, and you're going to, later on, of course, you're going to talk about reliability and how you build reliability again. One way is spare equipment. So nuclear plant has a spare equipment. So things are looking okay. You observe that the safety valve opened and then closed the short time. So the safety valve to relieve the pressure. We're going to talk about how it's working. So it, it relieved the pressure because for a short while there wasn't enough cooling to think, so that's okay. So the cooling water surrounding the reactor is hot. So we've got water around the reactor, we're cooling all the time, it generates a little bit of steam, everything's working great. Okay, time to go back to that cup of coffee. Unfortunately, that's not happening. So let's say this is what you think happened. So here's the reactor. Now you, you circulate water around the reactor to cool. That water becomes hot and then it, it's, it exchanges heat with another set of, another circle of water. It gets boiled and then we take the steam into a turbine. That turbine turns the turbine, turns the generator, we make electricity and away you go. So we have these two cooling, two, two water cycles, the one that makes the steam and the one that takes the heat from the reactor to the, to the generators. And we have to make sure there's water around this reactor. So the primary coolant pump stops. Uh, the steam turbine stops immediately because there's no steam. We're not, we're not generating that. The reactor cool. Uh, control rods drop, that's called a scram. Uh, the backup pumps start. Well, that's good, right? Because we want to circulate that water. We don't want that reactor overheating. The safety valve up here, so we're generating, we, we shouldn't be generating a lot of steam here, but if, if it does, if we do, then we will release it. So we don't want a lot of pressure build up. A light indicates that the safety valve is closed again. So now everything's copacetic. So we're cooling it, we're not losing any steam. Uh, this little level here says there's enough water. So this is sort of above the reactor, and if there's water in here, then there's got to be water around the reactor. And <clears throat> back to the coffin. Then a half an hour later, all hell breaks loose, and the plant is shut down and destroyed. So what happened? That didn't happen. The backup pumps, the spare pumps, had valves around them. Somebody closed the valves. So the pump was running, but then there were closed valves at the end of the pump, so it couldn't circulate water. Right? Those valves should never be closed. I'm sure they have big signs on them saying, never close this valve when the plant's in operation. They were closed. <coughs> so when you're thinking about safety, you have to think about human error. There's lots of, lots and lots of psychology. You could have a green button and a red button. And some, I could be standing and you say, push the green button. I hit the green button. Push the green button. Sooner or later, something goes on. You say, push the green button. I hit the red button. Everybody makes those kinds of mistakes. 
we don't want to kill somebody when, when one person makes a mistake. So we're going to have to account for that. They didn't account for that. There was no indication, which is a bad design, that these valves were closed. So the pump was running. The operators thought the cooling water cycling around and cooling the reactor. No, it wasn't. First mistake. The safety valve had an indicator and told the operator, I'm closed. <clears throat> it wasn't closed, it was open, and it was venting steam. That meant you were losing water. The cooling water is critical for cooling the reactor. It's just venting out. So there's a design mistake. That thing should never have indicated that. But the four people didn't realize it. This water level here was OK. So the operators thought that the water level around the reactor was OK. Because this is just by gravity. Right? So if, if there's water here, there must be water down here. Now the reactor's too hot. Is there any way that we could have water up here and not have enough water down here? How could that happen? How could that happen? Professor Dunn has told me that you, that you participate in class. Are you lying to me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, steam coming in the backflow from the one of the water. Exactly. So we're boiling water down here. And even if we have a, we could have a mixture of steam and water, most of it being steam, that just pushes everything up. So there's water up here, but there's not enough water down here to cool the system. So bad design. You tell the operators, look at this measurement. If there's water here, you don't have to worry. Bad design, bad training. Now, they they discovered that the pump that the valve was closed on the pump, so then they opened the valve so we could get cooling water. But then they said, what the heck, we don't have a problem anymore, so we'll turn the pumps off. So after they fixed the problem, then they introduced a second problem, they should have left the pumps on. All right, so what happened? A core meltdown. So this is the way you can become famous. Your engineering can make, you know, the, the front page of McLean's but you don't really want that kind of thing. So that's a bad design. And, and you really can't blame the people. The people made mistakes, but we have to account for those mistakes when we're on. And when you're under stress, it's very difficult to solve a problem under stress, number two. So you can't assume that somebody's going to, you know, you sit down for maybe a week, a group of people think through a problem and say, there's the solution. You can't expect somebody in five minutes or ten minutes under stress to come up with that solution. You can't do it. So we have to engineer the problem, plant so it's safe, and we have to put in extra systems. Okay, so, but sometimes, you know, if we have at least one bad accident, you work in a company that has one bad accident, they'll never have another one because they learned their lesson. Here's BP Texas City, 2005. They destroyed a huge piece of the plant with an explosion. They fired the chief executive officer. They committed to the world that they're going to be the safest company in the petroleum and chemical industries. 2010. Deepwater Horizon. <laughs> They killed a whole bunch more people. They fired the next chief executive officer, and now they're walking around the world saying we're going to be the safest company in the world. We're so nice to those people down at the Gulf Coast. We're buying all the crabs that are covered with oil. <laughs> the government is. That's what the government is doing. This company claimed it was, but a very poor safety. We're going to look at this problem. We're going to look at this and analyze it. We're going to see how many things. So, you are going to have to have your own ethical compass and your own skills to make sure that you don't take an extra practice. Okay, Fukushima is another one. We're out of time. There's some interesting things about Fukushima, but it isn't entirely clear what they could have done with the investigations. So, next class. 
we're going to say, how can we prevent this? What are the methods, some of the engineering design methods that can prevent these things from occurring? Because we want to be successful and we want to be alive and we want all our friends to be alive. And then you